Aloha. Well, let's see. Last two videos I posted have been about um, land, real estate, you know, conditions, uh, water, things like that, utilities. Um, well, I'm getting more hits on that stuff than I am anywhere else. So I'm going to continue because there is more to say on it. Um, I've been accused by a few people about being dramatic. They say, well, I, I failed drama in high school. <laughs> yeah, uh, humor I do okay with. Developed that on stage while I was a musician, but drama? Huh. Anyway, uh, yeah, I've, I've gotten some good questions from people in response to some of the last stuff I posted. And um, one of the things that I know I hadn't really talked about, actually, in the past, may as well. And it's uh, home construction here. You know, what's what's the right way at what elevation and what a part of the island to put together a house? Um, now, I will admit mm -hmm, that I thought I knew all about this before I came here. Yeah, I, I was pretty certain, you know, I'd, well, I'd had... Uh, uh, years of drafting in school, um, had studied dimensional metrology, measuring, precise measuring. Uh, I was a member of the Carpenters Union for 15 years. Um, I did work as a Finnish carpenter. Um, I, most of the time I was involved with uh, millwrights and joiners that in other words, we made wood windows and doors and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, I have, well, Fairly long experience, pretty decent experience in the construction industry. Some, I've never been a professional home builder. Let's say that right up. Okay. I know how to swing a hammer, but I've built pole barns. I've built chicken coops. I've built cabins, uh, you know, and such and such uh, in the past. So I'm no stranger to these ideas. Anyway, I had questions about it as far as, you know, like insulation, heating systems, cooling, at what elevation, and so on. And uh, that's a good study. Right. Like I said, I thought I knew a lot. And so when I got started, I uh, began by actually drafting my own house. I did my own home plans. And I took them out, and I bounced them against the lumber yard to see what the materials would come to. Ugh, I fainted. <laughs> it was really expensive. Uh, so, it, along the line, I went ahead and I had two professional architects draw plans for me. And so I used those. And again, once the materials lists were compiled, and I looked at things... I said, boy, oh boy, oh boy, ah, this is kind of expensive, beyond what I thought it was going to be. And this is now years ago, before the current inflation in materials. Um, but see, my, my original plan was that since I knew uh, people who were excellent carpenters, um, and they lived way up in the northern tier, you know, one of my friends up there in Alaska, uh, he is such a carpenter that he actually, uh, you know, we had security clearance to build the secret rooms in our embassies overseas that were not supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really good carpenter. Some guys in Wisconsin where I used to live, too. You know, my neighbor there, he's a great carpenter. Um, I figured, you know, I, what I'd do is I'd uh, hire these guys, bring them over, and we'd get the materials, take the plan, and we'd build a building. Well, you know, somewhere along the line, a few things happened. One is... The state really tightened up the owner-builder program over here to where you almost have to be a contractor yourself if you're going to even try this. Uh, that was a problem. Uh, yeah, the other was, of course, I realized that if I used uh, people uh, from on island, contractors here, builders here, uh, that... Well, they were going to go home at night in their own car. Somebody's going to cook them dinner. They're going to buy it at McDonald's. And I didn't have to worry about them. They had all their own tools. They had everything, see. And so uh, my liability, other than paying them for the work, was nil. 
But if I brought my friends in on it, well, I'm going to have to figure out how we're going to transport them till the project's finished. How am I going to feed them? You know, how are we going to get their tools here? And, and so many other logistical problems. See, I, I know people who figure this is the way they're going to get work done here. And you can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Um, but for me, at the time I was running nursery in uh, the Bay Area for the Navales partners, and I already had a management position at that time, which was causing me to pull out my hairs. Uh, and I decided, you know, aside from the fact of making this difficult, but uh, giving myself two jobs, you know, here as basically the overseer, the foreman, or whatever you want to call it, I was in charge of the, the whole situation. Uh, it, it was just more than I wanted to chew. Yeah. So I changed my plans. Yeah, that's that's where things began to change. Um, I don't remember the connection initially, but somebody mentioned to me about the package homes they use here. Possibly the realtor, I think, that I was doing business with uh, had brought this up. Yeah, for coming from the mainland, I'm, they, the package homes may exist in the mainland, but I just never knew anything about them. I, you know, most of it's uh, stick built, contractor built. Uh, Prefab, you know, there's a lot of ways they do things over there. But I hadn't seen this package concept. And so to explain the package concept briefly, it's just that um, you have at least three suppliers of materials here on the island that do this. There is Hansador, there is HPM, and there's Argus. Um, all of them will sell you a blueprint for a home in a certain style, um, it's a complete blueprint, and it's uh, ready for rubber stamp at the county for a permit. They're not going to argue over these things. They've seen hundreds of them. Uh, and then what they do is they will supply you the materials to build this at a price. And I mean, it's everything, pretty much. Uh, my package with Hansador, um, who is a Pacific Northwest lumber mill operation, uh, and on that, the quality of the lumber they sold me was incredibly good. Yeah, Hansler's lumber is high quality stuff. It, these packages then would include um, drywall, the roofing, the, all the studs, you know, the rafters, pretty much everything. Medicine cabinets, uh, bathroom sinks, uh, toilets, yeah, and garbage disposal. It, it had the whole works. I believe the only things I had to add to get this to a complete house was uh, it didn't come with any flooring there were no light fixtures with the package and uh, there was no concrete and so I had to provide some kind of a foundation um, I'm gonna have to go out pick out my own light fixtures for the house and uh, yeah so but it's it's very much a complete house and the price is really good when you buy it that way what I got from Hans Door was, like I say, the lumber. It was top notch. Um, the the kitchen cabinets, you know, which I, I I could have made alterations in the package, but I just didn't bother. I said, give it to me as is, pretty much. Um, kitchen cabinets, yeah, they they were oak. I'm not big on oak cabinets. We still keep talking about putting in maple, but you know, whatever, they work. They're solid. They have not fallen apart. I just don't like oak. <clears throat> I found this was the most cost-effective way to put up a home in, in the state of Hawaii. I, I didn't find any other way that was going to be any cheaper than that. Well, as it turned out, uh, A, going with the package home was the absolute best thing I could have ever done. Yes. And I decided to have local contractor put it up, who had a very good reputation. I, I pass his name along to anybody who's interested. His name's Jim Tarring. Um, this is a Jet Builders is the name of the company. Um, they did good work. Uh, they did it real fast. Um, 
Jim, I thought Jim's pricing was fair. Um, he gave me extras that I didn't really even ask for with no extra charge and so on. I, it was a good deal. I'm glad that I hired him to help me put this up. And what happened with that, though, is definitely two things that was really important. You know, I had said it, background as carpenter and so on, and, well, I, I thought I knew a thing or two about buildings well, it turns out I really didn't. <laughs> yeah, because conditions here in Hawaii are really so much different than they are on most of the mainland U.S. that most of what we learn there and use there really doesn't apply very well here. I mean, you drive a nail the same way, you know, you run a paintbrush the same way in any state of the union, right? But the, the the basics of the building design, the way the building is actually structured, uh, what's important, what isn't important, what you would do and what you definitely should never do. <laughs> and then again, the subcontractors we had. Now, I was not very pleased with the electrical subcontractor, by the way. Yeah, yeah that guy. But um, past that, the subcontractors were good. And the most important one was the guy on the dozer. Man, oh man, if I hadn't hired, you know, or sorry, if Jim hadn't hired this guy to do the work here on this particular site, we might have had water running right through the middle of our living room. Yeah, boy, when it rains here, I'm telling you, it's a torrent, and I'm, this whole place is on an angle, uh, points towards the sea, and uh, boy, when it comes down, if that guy on the dozer had not graded this site, absolutely perfect to divert all water around and send it down the side of the driveway and out of here it would have come right through the building oh god <laughs> yeah it's it's actually gotten a little close sometimes it has but no he, he did it right and we're good um Sometimes I think it was actually me pouring in more driveway gravel actually kind of interrupted some of the good grading he did uh, but yeah, there were things I would never have anticipated. Uh-uh. You know, I, for instance, I love skylights. <laughs> uh, you know, for years I worked in the wood window industry. We built skylights. Um, I had plenty of them in my house in Wisconsin. I like to lay there at night and watch the stars. But it's not a good idea where you get 120 inches of rain a year. Even the best of skylights could breach. If the light doesn't, maybe seal you made does, you know. Um, yeah, when you get solar panels put up on your roof, make sure whoever's doing it is putting a real good guarantee on the mounts they put through your roofs. I believe the guys I hired have, I don't know, 25 or 50 years or something on the seal for those mounts, because uh, it's a lot of rain. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wouldn't have guessed on some of this, and especially when it came to the design of the building. Yeah, I mean, it's subtle. It's really subtle, the differences in what I might have done and what the designers here who were familiar with conditions had done. But, you know, this is what they call a plantation-style house. Anywhere else on the mainland, they call it a ranch home. Yeah. The length of the eaves that extended over the outside of the building, I probably wouldn't have put uh, three-foot-plus eaves. I probably wouldn't have done that. Mainland, that is probably used a two-foot eave. Well, the three-foot eave is almost barely not enough sometimes. Uh, for one, having the big eave allows me to move all the way around my building during pouring rainstorms without getting soaking wet. I only have a tiny gap, a couple of feet, between the corner of my house and the corner where my shed comes up that I use for potting and work, you know, that I do in the nursery. And so even when it's pouring, I only have to streak two feet. <laughs> <laughs> to get between the two buildings um, without getting wet. And and so building structures around here that are set up so that you can operate during pouring rain is essential. Um, and I hear uh, a lot of mistakes from people who don't realize. <laughs> if you're not from here, man, and if you haven't lived here for a while, it's a pretty good chance you just can't figure this one out until you uh, experience it for yourself. Um, well, I was so happy that this place is built like that. It's got large lanai's on a couple of parts of the building. 
um, uh, that's a porch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a porch. Uh, it, we also have this very, very large, uh, you know, two and a half car carport that's part of this thing here. Um, and, uh, well, in the mainland, of course, we're used to garages. Well, I don't really need one here. Uh, it's, you know, there's no snow. It's none of the stuff that we need away. It's just having a roof over the top of the cars to, to keep the rain from falling on them. Because in Pune, if you park them in the rain long enough, the first thing that starts is algae. And the next thing is moss grows on the algae, followed by lichen. And pretty soon you get a Pune paint job. And it, yeah, it just ruins the finish of the vehicles um, completely. So keeping them under cover so they stay dry when you're not using them is a really great thing. But having the, the, the carport... Uh, oh, I have so many other uses for this thing. Yeah, having a, a it's a two wall part of the building, you know. I got the north wall, I got the east wall. I don't have the south or the west on this. Uh, that's where I'm sitting at the moment. Right along the west wall. I choose this space to work with my camera most of the time because it can start raining whenever it wants to. There's a roof over my head here. It looks like I'm out in the forest. But I am actually covered. Uh, this, oh, this makes so much difference. You may never have even thought about it, uh, you know, before you experience living here for a while. The other thing is the roof. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I know. Somebody's going to bark at me for how I pronounce roof. Roof, 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 like a dog. Yeah, it's R-O-O-F is what I'm saying. Roof. I think it's the way the rest of you pronounce roof. <laughs> it's like crick, pumpkin. Uh, it's all Midwestern things, I guess. I, some of that stuff never wears off. It becomes a permanent part of the speech. Because much of Hawaii uses the rainwater as catchment, uh, you really can't have an asphalt shingle roof here. You don't want the dirt, the rocks, the taste of the tar, uh, or anything else. The asbestos, maybe, or other five glass fibers. Things that are associated with making of uh, asphalt shingles. This is not something you want in your drinking water. Um, and neither can you really clean them. Um, we use uh, steel roofs here on most of the houses in Hawaii. Um, people who have a little bit more money, and I like things a little prettier. Uh, well, they use this uh, Japanese glazed tile. It's a clay tile with a glazing, not like the, our American Southwest adobe tiles. Um, they look like fish scales. Yeah, I always call them Japanese fish scales. Uh, they come in greens and blues. They're very attractive. They look really expensive, and I have a feeling they're difficult to set, too, being ceramic. Uh, but I, I have no experience with them other than seeing them in the neighborhoods on occasion. Most of us have steel. Various colors, uh, very similar to Alaska. Alaska uses this too. Um, it's common in the outlying areas of the United States, steel roofs. Um, they're pretty much made, I, I think it's just pretty much one company over here that's actually producing this stuff. I know HPM is involved in, in making the, the, the roofs. Um, my package was from Hansador, but the roof delivery came from HPM. They have a plant over here where they where they do this stuff. I guess the metal comes here on barges in big rolls and then they take it and run it through their processing, cut it to size and so on. Um, uh, there's probably a number of different reasons why this started. Uh, like for one, asphalt shingles are really heavy and really bulky. Um, and so shipping them over here gets expensive uh, to begin with. Uh, steel is cheaper than that because, it, you know, it's, you can get thousands of feet on a roll of this stuff. Um, and so that would be one reason I think this got started. The other is definitely the water catchment thing. These roofs are painted, powder-coated. They're Teflon uh, coated, I understand. Uh, I, I guess that's true. I've heard it because, man, when I was on one of these, when it got wet... Yeah, I felt like I was in a frying pan full of bacon grease. Uh, my cat can't even hang on to one of these roofs when it starts raining. She panics. Ah! <laughs> it starts sliding all over. They're slippery when they're wet. Um, but 
On the western side of the island, on occasion, I have seen buildings that had asphalt shingles. Um, I think there's a couple of well, sort of suburban-looking housing developments over there in the uh, uh, towards Kohala to the northwest. Um, that uh, well, they they look like something right out of Danville, California, as far as I'm concerned. And I think they all had asphalt shingle roofs. Um, I, I suspect that is done because, well, two reasons. One, that whole development I'm thinking of probably has public water, so they don't have to worry about catching. Um, but I also think I can tell by driving around there that almost everybody that lives there, they were born here, they came from somewhere else, uh, probably mostly West Coast, California, places like that, um, and they moved here to probably, you know, uh, to, to retire or something on that order. So the homes were built to appeal to that crowd, you know, and so asphalt shingles to them would mean quality and metal roofs would mean junk. <laughs> probably, I just, you know, put in simple terms. That's uh, probably why it's the only place I've seen any large amount of asphalt shingle roof. There's some otherwise Kona and Captain Cook. I've seen them on some of the more expensive homes. And again, I, I do believe it's people from the mainland bringing their thought process with them and then installing it here. Well, if you don't have catchment, asphalt, I guess, is fine. That's simple. Uh, I'm not sure how it reacts, though, with the lava. Uh, see, this is the only place I have ever lived in my entire life where I have to wash my roof. Yeah, I own a power washer over here, and every few years, depending on volcanic conditions, we have to get up on the roof and we have to power wash that thing down. Uh, my roof is almond colored, very light. Um, now, we did that intentionally, well, because it matched the, the, the home decor, but also I figured a light colored roof in a tropical environment reflects heat, the home will be cooler, and that was true. Uh, but it has other problems. One of the more common colors of roof around here is kind of a terracotta brick color uh, they use, a reddish. And I think it works better because it doesn't show the dirt as bad. Oh, the, the dirt is, uh, well, sometimes it's kind of black. It depends. But lately what I see up on my roof is reddish in color. I probably wouldn't see it as bad if I had a reddish terracotta colored roof. But if you don't wash it off, it's slightly acetic. Um, usually towards the bottom edge of the roof, uh, algae will begin to grow on it. After that, moss will begin to grow on it. And then it will just simply catch all the debris coming down, keep accumulating at the edge, and then rust the edge of your roof right off. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, the house walls here really should be repainted about every seven years because uh, it degrades. And you need to fresh it up. Otherwise, things will start going bad on you. Um, as far as the roof, they also periodically require repainting. I have not seen an official figure. I guess it depends, you know, on, on how often you clean it, you know, what the conditions are, and so on with the roof. Um, but yeah, I've already, uh, this was put on in 2007. Um, since then, uh, I, 15 years, I have already repainted the edge of my roof. You know, I'm starting to have a problem. Over there already, metal was beginning to oxidize and blister because of the algae and the moss. So, <laughs> I bet you weren't ready for that one, huh? <laughs> Washing your roof, yeah, really, it's very important. And, of course, you know, if you're catching water from the roof, which I catch water from my roof, but I don't use it for drinking. The water we catch for the, from the roof is for aquaculture and, and uh, water plants and so on. Um, so I, I'm not drinking it, and so I'm not too worried, but my cat drinks it all the time, and we, <laughs> she seems all right with it the way it is. But if you're drinking it in the house, you got filters and all kinds of stuff, but I still would like to have a nice clean roof if I was getting my drinking water from that source. Yeah, so now more directly to a question that I was actually asked. <laughs> okay, uh, it was a gentleman had a, a old piece of property at about 2,000 feet over on the Kona side. And uh, he's asking me, well, do I need uh, insulation? Do I need a heating system? Well, 
I think to begin with, the 2,000 feet is that's very, very borderline. Okay, it, it you can go one way or another when you're at that elevation. If you're at 4,000 feet, I, I would definitely recommend insulation and, and some sort of a heating unit. At 2,000 feet, it kind of depends. Uh, you know, I don't get cold easy. We did not put a heating unit into this house, nor did I put insulation into it uh, at the time either. We're at 1,600 feet, and for the most part, that works. Yeah, it, it works for me. Uh, Midwinter, after dark, uh, find me in a sweatshirt or a sweater almost all the time because we don't have a heating unit. And so I tend to, uh, you know, wear warm clothing after dark. Uh, that's suitable. It's enough. You know, it's it's enough. If I had the placement for design, uh, if initially in the design I had been thinking in this regard, I probably would have put an airtight thermostatic wood stove, very small one, like a Jotel, uh, Jotel, however they pronounce the Swedish ones. I, I, I would probably have done it. Yeah, a few sticks, January night, be real handy. I got plenty of firewood, you know, just pruning coffee and fruit trees around here. We have an endless supply of, of wood that we could use to warm up a house. Uh, as it is, the house wasn't designed, and I haven't laid anything out so that I really have a comfortable place to put one of these things here, and so I'm not going to do it, uh, probably, uh, I don't know, maybe when I get to be 90, I'll shiver. In the meantime, I just wear a sweatshirt when it gets cold, but guaranteed, even at 1,600 feet, if you don't have a heating unit in the winter, it does get cool. Not cold, cool. 50 degrees outdoors is usually the lowest temperature we ever see at 1,600 feet. Now, Kona side's a little bit warmer in general. It, it doesn't, it's not as cool over there. Um, they tend to be hotter and more humid most than the Hilo side. Um, Hilo side's wet, but we don't feel humidity as much because the temperatures are lower. Yeah. We feel humidity here more as a... Uh, um, uh, it's a, it's a thermal, uh, hypothermic factor that you, you begin to get cold uh, because the humidity in the air may be 95%. And at 52 degrees, 95% humidity, eh, strip the heat right out of your body. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you get hypothermia uh, on this side of the island. It's more of a concern than that, oh, I'm so hot, sweaty type humidity that the Kona side gets. Right downtown in Hilo, yeah, we see this two hot summer afternoons it gets pretty steamy down there too like i say it sort of depends on the sort of person you are what you want to put up with you know if if the comfort is essential if you're at 2000 feet i highly recommend you put something in the house to do some heating you're not going to need much but you might want that um especially on the Kona side or down low on the Hilo side, say below 500 feet, below 1,000 feet, somewhere in there, I would probably have some serious way of cooling the building. Now, you could do that naturally, you know, fans and, uh, and ventilation and this sort of thing. Uh, on this side would probably work out. Hawaii's conditions are just not that extreme. You know, we don't get 100 degree weather here, stuff like that. But it gets hot, and so if, you, on the other hand, there's air conditioning, you know, that's, and that's the standard way they deal with it. Um, you might consider it. It depends, again, you know, I, I was born in Chicago, and so, you know, half of the year the weather's like Delta, Louisiana, and the other half it's like Saskatchewan on the prairie. Uh, <laughs> So extremes like that don't really bother me too much, at least not, not much. Um, never gets like that here. It takes a long time for things to kind of swift shift one way or the other. They don't do it abruptly. but And we don't have great differences between winter and summer. So as far as insulation is concerned... Um, Far as I know, most of the package homes I've seen did not include insulation as part of the material. It's not commonly used here. 
I know that when I looked at the package and I saw it had all insulated uh, windows in it and patio doors, I went, hmm, okay, well, you know, haven't been a guy that built really top-end windows and doors, insulated ones, sometimes triple glazed, sometimes argon-filled, you know, low-E stuff, all kind of special, um, you know, environmental glass. Uh, that it's nice to have insulated windows. I said, okay, that's cool, but I don't think I really need them, you know. Well, it turned out they do help because the windows are where you lose the most heat or cold coming in and out of a building. Uh, but it's the frogs. And if I didn't have insulated windows when those frogs get started, oh. We're talking 90 decibels, same as a weed whacker or a leaf blower, uh, is the, 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 the volume of their call. And if they get within 10 or 20 feet of your house wall, oh man, you won't sleep. Um, so, that would be the biggest reason I would recommend putting insulation in your walls. Because... Right now, I don't have insulation in the walls, and the frog noise, when it gets too close, comes right through the wood. Yeah. Right through the plywood, right through the studs, and right through the drywall. Uh, it, it, it's muffled to some extent, but it's still often too loud. I will wake up in the middle of the night, and I'll hear, Cookie, cookie, cookie! And you sound like my fucking damn frogs! Yeah. It's like that. Don't like them. Uh, so, insulation is highly recommended just to keep the noise level down. And even if you're one of these people that says, Oh, Bill, I don't understand why you hate those frogs so bad. You know, I, they put me to sleep. I hear this. Uh, yeah, whatever. But, uh, you got roosters. And sometimes, if it's a full moon and you're sitting next to one of them rooster farms, uh, it's all night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you got four-wheel drive jacked up monster trucks with huge balloon inflated tires that half the time with a bad muffler. It's very noisy over here. It's very noisy over here. There's dogs. All the time dogs, you know. Oh, then a pig comes around, and that dog's go nuts in the middle of the night. Anyway, yeah, that's funny, huh? Well, oh, I guess I'll admit, that was drama, wasn't it? I dramatized the dog. Yeah, I was doing impressions here. But, yeah, you, you, you really might want to insulate the house just so you can keep the noise levels down. Depends. You know, I mean... I lived across the street from some nice, quiet people uh, who sold the properties some, to some Honolulu owners who in turn rented it to, I don't know, it must be a dozen people living on that 20 acres over there now. I don't know how many are actually living in there, but you know, one of them's a rooster farmer. Yeah, the supply and the cockfighting trade. Uh, and it's noisy. And they moved in, and then a guy with a canine patrol moved in over there, too. And so there's dogs barking and roosters calling. They weren't there to begin with. <laughs> had I put insulation in the walls but when I first built the house, uh, I'd had uh, a little bit more protection <laughs> against whatever the neighbors are doing. So, yeah, 2,000 foot cone of sight, highly recommend insulation in the walls. Make sure you put in insulated windows. Consider a small heating unit of some type or another. You know, depends if you got a city lot or something, then you, you know, burning firewood doesn't make any sense. If you're on a larger parcel where you can have wood, I, I'd say I would use wood, uh, but. I'm comfortable with that. I used it for 17 years when I lived in northern Wisconsin. It temperatures down to 40 below zero. You know, we had firewood piles the size of a semi-trailer. Yeah, uh, it would be a pleasure around here to put up my firewood pile. I think it would need to be, oh, you know, maybe about two feet high and <laughs> three feet wide, you know, 18 inches deep. 
Winter's firewood. I'd feel good about that. Actually. Well, you know, and of course, when you're uh, uh, deciding on how you're going to put the house in, uh, you have two major choices of how to set it down around here. Uh, in Hawaii, we use both slab foundations and we use post and pier where the houses are set up on pylons. And they vary in height, depends. If you're out there near the coast, they may be steel reinforced concrete for tsunami and 16 feet off the ground. This, this, this exists here. Um, you know, uh, otherwise, the, I think the county's recommendation or the, the zoning is that you got to be uh, uh, 18 inches off the ground. That's the law, but people will go beyond that in the state order to get a view. You know, if you if your property doesn't have a view from ground level, but you got maybe a view at the second story or something on that order, well, building for the view and the air circulation. The view is an aesthetic. The air circulation is a practical. And they kind of go together. <laughs> Somebody tells me, oh, Bill, you got a great view. I said, yeah, I got really good air circulation. Um, yeah, I, I sat down here, started doing this recording. Uh, I'll edit it out, but I shot a mosquito while I was sitting here. Yeah, they, they're around. And the more the air moves, the better. Yeah, it keeps them down. Nice, good breeze keeps the insects out, keeps the mold down. Uh, but, yeah, you got this uh, uh, slab foundation, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. They got slabs in the mainland especially down south in the deserts and stuff, uh, where they just, you know, basically put up a form, compact the, the earth beneath, you know, with gravel and rocks and pour a foundation, uh, the floor and all, um, and set the house right on top of it. We don't uh, uh, really build basements here, and so that sort of a foundation, like you might know in Illinois or someplace where you have a basement, you know, that's it's not done. I haven't seen one yet, anyway. But it sounds like a real problem with water leakage. <laughs> water is an issue here. Roofs is an issue. Basements, forget it. Yeah, you know, they just flood probably. So if you go on Post and Pier, it's a little more expensive usually because uh, you have more structural material in the floors. You have to frame out and build uh, floors, uh, two by sixes, an inch plywood, and so on. Uh, so you got more material underneath your building to walk on. Yeah, when you use concrete as a slab, well, you don't have any of that structural material below. You just, with a vo vapor barrier, you just you know, you put your flooring down on top of your concrete and you're done. Um, but you have to have joists and reinforcing and flooring and stuff otherwise. Um, I don't like post and piers as much, mostly because around here, creatures like to crawl under everything. Yeah, uh, my my kitty cat here, uh, <laughs> she's walking up the hill here behind me, I think. Um, yeah, Gracie, that's, that's how, how we found her here. She was underneath my shed with kittens <laughs> you know she crawled under there to have her kittens and then uh, raised them beneath the shed well not so bad you got a you got a feral cat you know with kittens underneath your shed okay big deal but rats do the same thing mongoose do it roaches do it centipedes do it you name it man i don't like the post and pier stuff as much be mostly because of those reasons it's just one more access point for things. Uh, it's more expensive. And when you have a solid slab of concrete under the building, nothing comes in from underneath. Uh, it, my house is set at least a good uh, it's four inches of concrete rise to the slab. Slab goes on and then there's another four inch rise from the slab to the bottom wall of the house. Um, which brings to mind also, I had mentioned about the size of the eaves. Um, in a rainy climate like the one we have here, if your house is built so that the roof eaves are so large that they never let water touch the walls of the building, your house is going to last a whole lot longer. If you have short eaves, um, 
the water's going to hit your wall and, and it, it will deteriorate much quicker in this environment. Uh, this house, actually the entire house itself, stays almost perfectly dry during storms um, because of the size of the eave. On occasion, when we get a hurricane or something coming through here, rain becomes horizontal and it will sweep in, but not very often. Not very often. So this is a consideration. Size of eave uh, on the roof to keep the house wall dry against the foundation. I'd say that was most of the thoughts I had in mind this morning. Uh, I can't come up with much anything else off the top of my head. But there's some further information about the kinds of building and the way to look at things here. My best advice to anybody, no matter how much you think you know, if that knowledge wasn't gained from life here in this environment, you're really better off to uh, find somebody that does know about the environment to uh, to help you through this because... Chances are there could be a few fatal flaws that come in. Uh, you know, if you take too much charge, uh, too much charge over what's going on there. Uh, I see it. Yeah, I see it. People got their ideas, and their ideas just don't make any sense here at all. Yet, they make some guy nail it up that way, and once it's nailed up, oh man, it could take a lot to reverse what was done, and sometimes it doesn't work out well at all. Uh, lots of surprises <laughs> lots of surprises yeah if, if you only vacationed here and got the idea you'd like to live there's lots of surprises alright folks hang loose <laughs>